Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through 21. And all week long, I've been studying this book and this, this scripture, and it's been very enriching to myself. And the Lord's really used it to speak to my heart. And um, we'll probably this morning be a lot more teaching than preaching. Um, but I hope that the Lord will speak to you as um, powerfully as, as he has me and as clearly as I've really gleaned a lot from this book and from these texts. And so uh, Ephesians chapter 5 is where we'll begin our reading, beginning in verse 15. Verse 15 of Ephesians 5. See that you walk circumspectly, it just means carefully, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess. Or that word excess would mean wastefulness. It's wasteful to be like that. But be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And I'll conclude our reading this morning. That's reading... Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15 through verse 21. I'd like to call your attention to one more verse of Scripture in the book of Ephesians, and that's in chapter 4, of verse 1. So if you turn there real quick, that's where we'll get our title this morning and kind of the main thoughts that we have upon our mind, but we're going to spend some time in Ephesians 5 as well. Ephesians chapter 4, looking at verse 1. It says, <clears throat> I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord... Beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Again, that's Ephesians 4.1. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that ye walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. The title of our message this morning is Walking Worthy of Our Calling. Walking Worthy of Our Calling. Now, obviously, the word walking is meant to indicate how we live our lives. That you think of you're walking through life, and that's usually an analogy that represents that. Paul, in the book of Ephesians, that's a common theme he comes back to. Seven separate times in the book of Ephesians, Paul pays note to how we have walked, how other people walk, and then he gives us instructions on how we are to walk. And so this morning, we want to talk about walking worthy of our calling. Now, before we can get to Ephesians chapter 5 and really dig into verses 15 through verses 21, we have to understand what's gone on before this in the book of Ephesians. Because Oftentimes, people will say, you know, you need to un understand the context of a scripture to know what it means. And certainly there's truth in that. But I would also contend that when we understand the context of something, it brings out its beauty. That we understand it more deeply. And there the profundity of what's being said and the implications it has on our lives are greater when we understand the context. Now, Paul in the book of Ephesians does what he does in almost every one of his books. He splits it into two parts. And in usually part one of his books, he states, this is the truth. These are the facts. That would be known in the English language as an indicative. He's not trying to prove anything, but he's merely proclaiming something that is true. In the book of Colossians, the first two chapters are Indicatives. The last two chapters are what's called imperatives. The same as in the book of Philippians. The first two, he's indicating a truth. If you go to the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters, he's declaring truth. 12 through 15 are going to be uh, the parts where he is giving it an imperative. In lieu of what we know, what I've declared to you, this is how I want you to live. He does that in almost all of his books. One reason I believe the book of Hebrews was written by Paul 
is the very same reason. 1 through 11, he states the facts. And then 12 and 13, he says, now live this way. So really what gives us our understanding of what he's saying in 4 through 6 is understanding what he told us in 1 through 3. So in chapters 1 through 3, Paul is writing to this church at Ephesus, and here is the main theme of what he is saying, particularly in the first two chapters. He's trying to tell us, this is what God has done for you. And so he goes through this long list in chapters 1 and 2 primarily, saying these are all the things God has done to you. Now I want to read to you this morning. I wrote down that list of the things that in Ephesians 1 and 2, and you can go and and check all the verses here. I'd be happy to give it to you. All the things that it says God has done for us. So listen to this list as quickly as I can go. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ in verse one, or chapter 1, verse 3. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world in verse 4. He lavished us with redemption and forgiveness. He has adopted us as children. He has revealed the mystery of God's will to us. He has given us an inheritance in Christ. He has sealed us with the spirit of promise. He offers to us the spirit of wisdom, enlightenment, a calling and power to know the the power of Christ's resurrection. In chapter 2, he has saved us from a life of alienation and sin. He's rescued us from the control and influence of Satan. He has changed us from children of wrath to children of God. He has given us eternal life despite our sinful nature. He has made us examples to the rest of the world of God's grace in us. He has saved us by grace through faith. He has created us anew as his workmanship through regeneration. He has ordained good works for us to walk in. He has broken down the division between people groups and ethnicities and made us into one new man in the image of Christ. He has brought us near to God through Christ and made us heirs of the covenants of promise. He has preached to those who are afar off the knowledge of God. He has granted us continual access to him through his spirit. He has changed our identity from foreigners to fellow citizens of the kingdom of God. He has built us upon a solid foundation, the apostles and the prophets' teachings and the chief cornerstone, Jesus Christ. He has fitly framed us together as a church, as members in particular. He's made us a dwelling place suitable for God. And finally, he grants us access to come boldly and with confidence to a God that can do exceedingly abundantly beyond what we can ask or think. What a list, right? Those are the spiritual blessings that God has given to us as believers. We could break apart each one of those and find an endless depth of personal meaning and freedom in Christ in just studying every single one of those because every one of those 23 examples is just a description of God's innumerable blessings that he has given to us. So as I was reading down through chapters 1 and 2 and into chapter 3 and I read all of these things and as I'm writing these things down, I'm becoming overwhelming, overwhelmed about what God has done for sinners that have been saved by God's grace in Christ. The natural response that I have is what the psalmist said in Psalm 116, what shall I render unto the Lord for all of his benefits? Right? Whenever we're given a gift and it is of immense value that is almost breathtaking, isn't the natural response of the human heart, what can I do? I want to do something back. Now the reality of what the scripture says is there is nothing we can give God back that could come anywhere close to repaying. And so this morning, I don't want to insinuate that God has given us all these blessings, so let's repay him. No, that's not what we want to do. Because repaying would would be implying that we have something of value that we could offer God. We don't. 
But rather the question that comes to my mind or the, the, the desire is not what can I give to the Lord to repay him, but to love him back. I just want to love him in this life as God. And I'll say this. I don't believe as Christians, our carnal minds can possibly comprehend a small portion of the blessings that he's revealed to us in Ephesians 1 and 2. I can read them. We can study them. We can analyze them and turn them upside down and contemplate them and ask God to reveal them. But even if God revealed revealed the, the, the deeper meaning, he would only be able to reveal them in part. Because truly, until we get to heaven, we won't be able to understand even in part the depth. And I would argue, even when we get to heaven, part of the glories of heaven will be further understanding the revelation of God the longer we're there. So Paul writes to the Ephesian church, a church that he established, and you can read about that in the book of Acts, the people that he knew, a group of people who grew up in the pagan epicenter of the Roman world, or one of the pagan epicenters of the Roman world, and he's trying to teach them about what this man Jesus, or what God has done through this man Jesus Christ, and he tells them all this list of things, and then in chapter 4, he pivots, and he says, now... In lieu of that, and that's what he says in verse 4, I therefore, the prisoner of, of God, I beg you to walk worthy of your calling. Somebody were to step out in front and save your life and die in exchange for your life, wouldn't there be this feeling of indebtedness and gratitude or the natural response, what can I do? I want to show my love back. Well, thankfully, Paul tells us. And so verses, chapters 4 through 6 is him telling us, and you can denote that by when he says the word walk. This is the way in lieu of what he's done. So you never want to detach from your understanding what God has done as that being your motivation. And then what do I do in lieu of that? So in chapter one, or excuse me, in chapter four, he tells us the disposition that we ought to walk with. And I'm not going to cover all these things this morning. When Kathleen asked me what I was going to preach on, I said the book of Ephesians. And she said, that's, that's going to be a long sermon, right? So I don't want to cover everything here. Nonetheless, he gives us in chapter one, here's the, or excuse me, in chapter four, here's the disposition that you ought to walk with when you walk. Lowliness, meekness, humility, Love. He goes on and gives this detailed explanation of the way we ought to walk in lieu of what God has done for us. He continues in chapter 4 and he goes to verse 17. And you can read it for yourself. Then he says, here are the ways you don't walk. Now what this is going to do in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 is he's making a clear allusion back to chapter 2. You remember in chapter 2 the famous text that oftentimes uh, people read that in times past, you walked according to the course of the world. Uh, it continues, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of, of disobedience. So he lays out, you used to walk this way. And he concludes in verse 4, in that you were dead in your trespasses and in sins, apart from life in Christ. But God in his immense love, wherewith he loved you, he saved you by grace through faith. And now you're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus. And so Paul in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 17 reflects back on Ephesians 2 and says, Listen, you walked according to the course of this world when you were lost. And now you are called not to live that way. Now I'm just going to make this plain what should be obvious statement. But I feel the need to, to make it this morning. Saved people ought not to walk like lost people through this life. There must be a distinction between the way that we live our lives and the way that lost people live our li their lives. Now, when we live our life, you see, what we do is we oftentimes we plan and we think. And we take into consideration all these different variables and all these different goals and all these different expectations. And so if we imaginary were to sit at a kitchen table and you're sitting there with your family and you're laying all these things out and you're designing your life. 
I hope the things that you put on the table are much different than your neighbor if they don't know the Lord. The things that you take into consideration when you're making decisions ought not to be the same as other people. The expectations you have of the people in your home ought to be explicitly different. I think often they're implicitly different, and that can be the problem. Implicit just meaning there's an understanding here. No, Paul didn't say, walk worthy of your calling, and you know what that means. Paul said, walk worthy of your calling, and here's how you do it, and here's how you don't do it. Teaching children, teaching one another what we, how we walk, how we live life. You know, that includes, when I was studying this and I was looking at what that word walk meant, I began to go through the book of Ephesians and try to look at the nuances of how he expressed himself. Because what we could say is this, we could say the word walking just means our behavior. But when we really study closely what Paul says in Ephesians 4 through 6, we realize it's not isolated to our behavior. Well, then the natural next thing we think is, okay, then our actions and our behavior. Excuse me, our words and our behavior. But Paul even goes further than that. Paul says not only does he want to govern our behavior as a way to show our thankfulness to God, our words, he also gives comments about our intentions, where things come from when we're doing something, that they don't stem from a root of bitterness or a root of anger, or a grudge. All of those things can be concealed from our words and our actions. And Paul says, when we're living a life to glorify God and give him thanks, we need to consider also our temperament. What's on the inside of our motivation? Ephesians 5, we we stopped right at the text that I thought I was going to be preaching on this week. Our relationships. How wives and husbands and children and parents and masters and slaves, Paul gets into that whole text about how those relationships are to function. The point being, walking as a Christian impacts every single area of who we are. I think sometimes what has happened is we've implicitly said, well, everybody just knows how you all to act as a Christian. And then it gets limited down to actions and words, or in other words, what people can see. And as long as you're checking the boxes of being kind, not cursing, paying your taxes fairly, doing the things that you couldn't get in trouble with the government for, then you're living as a Christian. But when we talk and when Paul is advocating to us and commanding us that that's the way we need to live, it's more than just what people see. Verse 17, he reflects back in Ephesians 2 and he's saying, don't walk as they used to walk as you used to walk and as Gentiles walk. Make sure you live differently. He comes in Ephesians 5, chapter 2, we're trying, verse 2. We're trying to get to the text that we read this morning. Context is necessary. He gets to verse 2, and he starts making comparisons, jumping back and forth. He tells us in all of that, he says that we ought not to speak, have corrupt communi- communication come out of our mouth, but rather... We ought to speak things that are encouraging. So what would be examples of corrupt communication? Gossip. Things that we don't know are true, but we talk about them as if we know they're true or we're speculative about things. Well, I think their motive is X. That's a a gang green that can grow up in a church. You know that? Gossip. And Paul here is saying, Don't let corrupt communication come out. But in its place, put something else. Words that are edifying. We don't use that word edifying very much anymore. The word edifying means something that builds up. In my mind, when I oftentimes think of people's words, I think of two types of people. The analogy is really always stuck in my mind. Fountains and drains. There are some people you're around, and their words are negative Gossipy, they, they always have a demeanor of pessimism, of anger, of discouragement. And when you walk away, you're emotionally and spiritually being drained. 
That's how lost people walk around. That's the corrupt communication that ought to be limited to Gentile or lost people living. Paul is saying, you replace that when you become a Christian. You want to walk worthy? The way God wants you to walk is to build people up, is to encourage people, is to help people, is to uh, think on pure things and do pure things and use your voice as one that can speak up in aid of people. All right, somebody's parents are acting out, or excuse me, somebody's kids' parents have their kids acting out. I guess it could be the other way too, right? Somebody's parents are acting out for some of you older ones. And it's easy to walk out of the house of the Lord. It's easy to walk out of a setting. Did you see them? Very easy to do, isn't it? Very natural to do to our sinful nature. Or we can be a beacon of encouragement and say, brother, sister, hang in there. It gets better as they get older. Hey, can I help you? Can I take them out during a point in the service so you can be a little more attentive today? Paul is telling us in Ephesians 5, we need to substitute. And there are seven things. He talks about the person who's lazy and won't work. That'd be applicable in our day, wouldn't it? Young men, young women, who would, especially in this time, young men who would not go out and work. That would steal or cheat to do things. And he says, let those who steal go and work and then be a cheerful giver. Right? So he gives us seven things as Christians Ways we ought to substitute our bad behavior with good behavior. And all of those things we are doing with the motivation of expressing our love for what God has done for us in Christ. And then that pulls us to our scripture text in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. He tells us when he lays this text here, he says, now when you walk, he's told us how we Ought not to do things, how lost people do things, and then what we ought to replace them with. And now he says, when you live life, live carefully, circumspectly. Now, the Bible, multiple times in the New Testament, Paul and, and Peter will give these instructions to beware, to be circumspect. And every time I see that, Every time you read that in the scriptures, it ought to alert you that what he is saying is not something easy to do or easily noticeable or natural to us. So he says, as you live life, walk carefully. And then he gives us a list of three things that we ought to do to live carefully. So this morning, as you listen, ask yourself as we go through these three things, whether you're being careful about doing these things in order to show God in a form of worship, you appreciate what he's done. Three things. Here's number one. Verse 15. See that you walk carefully, circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. And then here's what he says in verse 16. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. The way we walk carefully as Christians is we're very cognizant of our time. We're very careful with it. Wasting time is a sin. Now, please don't let don't let your mind give me a second. All right? I'll just put it that way. Give me a second. Because I think initially. When we begin to make statements like this or what Paul makes later in chapter 5, immediately as Americans, we go on alert. We say, whoa, whoa. That's extreme. Let's think about what Paul is saying here. Jesus took time to rest in his life. It's not saying you put the pedal to the metal and you never take a break. It's not what Paul said. Paul's not saying you don't enjoy life. We find instruction in Ecclesiastes and Proverbs that we are to enjoy life and the things that God has given us because who knows who might come after us that will waste all of those things. And so there is a sense to which within proportion to, I'm going to stop there, within reason, we're to enjoy life. 
However, I would argue in our culture, we've taken that way too far. Where we have designed our lives in order to compartmentalize things as much as possible, and within that compartment, I just live however I want. I live as freely, I get off work, I've done the church thing, I've been the dad or the husband thing, now I can just go spend the other time however I want to. And if that means binging on the couch watching Netflix, if that means spending all day on a Saturday watching football games, if that means every single week I have this time and I can do whatever I want, this morning I would pray that God might reveal to you how you could more carefully use your time. He says, we ought to be careful as Christians. Why? Well, let's consider those examples for a moment. That's what the world does with their time. But you see, there's something about what we know about this life that is different from what lost people know. God has revealed to us that what goes on down here has implications in eternity and that people are walking blindly according to the lust of their own flesh and their God is themselves and what they're striving to do is ultimately please self. And the way you please self is you use your time to make yourself happy. And so the world, and especially our culture, has created all of these activities and all of these things in order that a person might fill their life with happiness. And that is the end of life. People work Monday through Friday, 40, 50, 60 hours a week, putting in overtime. Why? So that they can just live on Saturday and Sunday. As Christians, we know better. God has revealed in his word that life is more than that. That life that God has given us, each one, both a general purpose through his word, but a specific purpose that we can carry out in our lives to affect the people around us and in affecting them, glorify God. So how do we spend our time? In a way that pleases God. He says, be careful Now, this isn't the only time that Paul gives us admonition. In in Colossians, when we get to chapter 3, you can go look for yourself. He says the exact same words, making sure that we're redeeming the time. The 139th Psalm tells us the exact same thing over and over in Scripture. God is clear that we're here for such a short amount of time and that he desires us to use that within the medium of faith to give him honor and glory. See, a person, the more faith a person has and the more God reveals to them, I believe the more they use their time wisely. And here's the reason, is because they catch a glimpse of the spiritual. And when we see the spiritual, it compels us to live according to the spiritual. Because what we realize is that we've been deceived into thinking the carnal is the rich stuff, the spiritual is the poor, boring stuff. So let's go do the poor, boring stuff only when we have to. But when God's Spirit enlivens us and He shows us the truth about our existence and what God wants to do in us and through us, then our cravings are no longer for Netflix or football or golf or any of the activities that we have, but our craving becomes the spiritual thing things of God. And we feel compelled to live differently, more carefully. We're jealous of our time. This morning, how jealous of you are your time? In what ways when your mind, when you're planning out your week and your days, is coming into the decision-making process, God, how can I use my time to further your cause or simply glorify you? See, sometimes it's not even doing. I think as Christians, we can get in this habit of you just got to do, 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 and that's how you please God. No, sometimes it's in being who God wants you to be, where you're at, and that glorifies him. In other words, this. Sometimes instead of going out and trying trying to preach the gospel to somebody, instead of studying my Bible, sometimes what God wants me to do is intentionally be a father to my boys. And when I'm fathering my boys, I'm glorifying God in that. Because I'm thoughtful and I'm intentional. I'm saying, God, when I parent these kids, when I go in there and play and wrestle in the living room, I want them to see how much time and attention and love, how personalized my love is for them. And in seeing that, they will transmit that in how their heavenly father is towards them. 
Sometimes just being intentionally. I was at the restaurant just yesterday. Sat down. I couldn't help but notice right next to me. Father and his daughter and the entire hour on their phones at breakfast. Listen, I'm not going to sit here and say there wasn't maybe a reason for it. I don't know their situation, but here's what I want to point out. That, I couldn't help but think as I was watching that. That girl needs you. 10, 12-year-old girl, awkward stage in life. She needs the confidence and love and affection of a, not a phone. Carefully being jealous with their time and saying, you know what? Here at dinner, here at breakfast, here at lunch, God, I'm going I'm to try to honor you. I'm going to carefully be a father or a mother to my children. Being jealous of that. That's worshiping God. And I think when you get to verse 22, the awkward verses, that's what he's trying to express. Maybe we'll get to that at some point. Number one, how do we, walk care- how do we live our life carefully as Christians? We be careful with our time. Here's the second thing Paul hits. Number 17. Wherefore, be you not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. First thing, we got to make sure we're using our time the way God wants. Well, then how do we know how to use it? That's verse 17. Now, you need to know what the will of the Lord is. Now, I think there are two general ways that we can know this. One, got to be a student of his word as a Christian. I didn't say a reader, I said a student. Big differences. Really big differences in a student and a leader. Excuse me, a reader. I can go get a medical book, medical textbook, and I can read about any system in the body. And I can read about all the connections and all the important physiology and functions of it. But if I'm just trying to get a cursory understanding, when I'm just reading it, my intentions and what I'm gaining from it is vastly different than what I hope a surgeon's intention is when they're reading the same book. Because the two of us, although we might be both desirous to know what it says, are going to use it in vastly different ways. I'm afraid today many Christians are readers of God's word, but they're not students of God's word. A reader has a little planner at home, and they write down, read the 45th Psalm today. And they get up in the morning and they say, I got my devotional this morning and they read the 45th Psalm and they check it off and they go to the next thing on the checklist. I'm not saying there's not a place for that. Don't get me wrong. A student says, I to know the will of the Lord and how I am to live this life, I must understand what it says and how I should carry it into practice. Notice the word Paul uses there. There's a difference in the scriptures between the word knowledge and understanding. Paul says, understanding what the will of the Lord is. See, when we're sitting in the house of God and we've all got our shirts and ties on, we've all got our Bibles out, mine may look rugged, yours may look more rugged, mine may look like it's not. The key is not that people are reading it, but it's that when they sit down and they get to something and they ask, you know, very easy way to, to... understand, come to understand your Bible, ask yourself a question. So we've already hit on this morning. Ask this question. How do I be a godly father? Ask yourself that question and then set yourself loose in the scriptures and try to understand what it looks like. Not just be nice, right? Which is kind of the American response. The way you're being being a good father is you make a whole lot of money, you spoil your children, and you be nice. It's not what the Bible says. You want to come to be a student of the Bible versus a reader? Say, okay, I want to be a good father. How do I do that? And then search and try to answer your question. And then when you get all the answer down, ask yourself this. Can I do this? Like, is it something I can do? Or is it hodgepodge philosophical stuff that is not able to implement? Because if you can't put it into action, it's likely you don't understand it yet. Paul is saying here, you want to walk carefully in this life? Be careful with your time and understand what God's will is. In a general sense, for fathers, all of it's the same for us. 
Thankfully, not only does God reveal it through his word in a general sense, but then he also gets specific with us through his Holy Spirit. God can reveal to us individually what his will is through his Holy Spirit. I'll give you an example of this with fathering, and I'll move on to the next thing that Paul says. As you all will come to learn, many of you already know, my oldest son and my second son are very different. I can't overstate that, I don't think. Right? If they were different color skinned, I don't think they could be more different than what they are now. Right? Very different. As parenting, as they're growing up, I'm recognizing more and more how much different my application of God's word is towards one of them versus another one of them. And when it comes to one of them, and I won't tell you which one, I'm finding myself digging in God's word. I'm finding myself applying different different aspects of how God teaches us to be with one of them versus the other, because ultimately I'm trying to get them to the same place, that they would be mighty men of God. But I'm recognizing more and more, it's not just this one, do this. And thankfully, God gives us wisdom and insight as Christians on how we can do that. So here would be an applicable question that you could ask if you want to become a student versus just a reader of God's word. How do I be a good father, a biblical father rather? And then you could say something like this. How do I be a biblical father to Judson Hicks? And then God, through his word and through his spirit, will reveal to you what the will of the Lord is. Paul says, you want to walk carefully? Redeem the time. Use good use of your time. Secondly, know what the will of the Lord is. And then he gets to the third one in verse 18, and here's what he says. And be not drunk with, the, with wine wherein is excess. There's a wasteful. Wasteful of what? If you get drunk, what's that wasteful of? Your time. I would, I would go even further and say not just your time, you. It's a waste of you. And remember, in chapter 4, verse 1, you were called to walk worthy of something higher. So he's saying, you're wasting you. You ever heard somebody say that? about? We had a student at my school about 10 years ago who was a phenomenal athlete, best athlete by far ever come through the school. But if you look at all the ribbons, you look at all the names, all the pictures on the wall, all the trophies, not one of them have his name on it. All the scholarships that have been offered, not one of them has his name on it. Because he didn't harness his gift. You would never know. In the hall of great athletes, how good he was. Because he wasted what? Himself. Paul is saying, don't be drunk with wine. Because it's wasteful of you. You're wasting what God has given you in yourself. And then what does he say in verse 18? But be filled with the Spirit. There is notably something different when God's people walk in the Spirit. I'm not going to take the time this morning to say all the experiences I've had watching people walk in the Spirit and the overflow of them doing so, but all I can say is this, when I see it, I know it. And the ripple effect of them walking with the Spirit of God, what does that mean? What is it? Living in the Spirit, walking in the Spirit mean? It means God's Holy Spirit is governing them from the inside. And that is discernible by other people. I can see God using this person. And it's not always what we think it is. It's not always in some big manifestation like it is me up here preaching or you testifying. Sometimes it's the disposition of forgiveness towards people who have wronged them and they have love and gentleness and the absence of bitterness in their life and they emanate forgiveness and the kindness of Jesus Christ towards people and you're around them and you say, man, that person has something of God in them. It's not always this religious action and that's what Paul says in Ephesians. He says, verse 18, be filled with the Spirit. Three ways. 
Three ways that from verse 15, we're to walk carefully. Now I'll say this, it is hard to walk in the Spirit. Because everything about my carnal body and yours wars, Paul says in Romans, against it. And if you wake up in the morning and you're not intentional, you'll walk the rest of the day in the carnal flesh. That's why he begins it with saying, be careful the way you live your life. Thoughtful. I'm going to close with these last three things here. Paul then tells us, thankfully, how we can be filled with the Spirit in the next few verses. So you say this, okay. I want to live more carefully. I get the idea of living more carefully with my time. I get the idea in verse 17 that I need to study and I need to understand the will of the Lord better. And I think I can map out ways to do that in a sense. But how am I more regularly filled with God's Spirit? Paul tells us three things we can do to be more filled with God's Spirit in the next verses. Look what he says in verse 20. Excuse me, verse 19. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. I would... How many people, I'm going to take a little poll, how many people can say in your own life when God has put a song on your heart, it has brought you closer to the Lord? Raise your hand. I think that's pretty natural for all Christians, isn't it? That when God has implanted and inspired in you a song, I want you to realize that's not just isolated to you. But God is saying in the scriptures, the way that you can be filled with the Spirit is by having a song that you speak to one another and that you sing with one another unto the Lord. There is something unique, and I don't understand what it is, but there is something unique about singing to the human heart. I think that's why it's going to transcend into heaven is because there's something about melody and words that can express ourselves, I'm tempted to say almost more than anything else. It brings this new dimension to it, right? Because I get up here with words and they have these these static meaning. But then it's no longer a 2D meaning when you add the third dimension of music to it. It suddenly gives this expression that transcends the words in and of themselves. And Paul says, to be more filled with the Spirit, let yourself sing songs. I would encourage you this morning to practically put that in your life. Come up with a a time in your day, a time in your life, a time in your week where songs and spiritual melodies can fill your life. Paul says the result is that you'll walk in the Spirit more. Look at verse 20. Here's the next thing. Giving thanks all, always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be filled with the Spirit more? Be a thankful person to God. God blesses you with something during the day. Whisper a prayer of thanks to God. Have a constant communication. There, are, I, I think oftentimes there's two people, there's two types of mentalities in the world. There's people who look at the world. And they look at everything that's wrong with the world that's happening to them. And because of that, they're disgruntled all the time. They look and say, it was a rainy day today, and I was going to go outside and enjoy the nice weather. And they can find these petty ways always to be upset because what they want, what they're expecting, is for life to just be perfect. Everybody to be kind and nice. But the strange things, you know, our sinful nature, even when everything is perfect, guess what? We're still unhappy. Paul is saying here, that ought not to be the disposition of a Christian's heart when we walk through life. If we're going to be filled with the Spirit, we ought to sing songs, with melody, sharing them with one another. Always giving thanks for all things unto God, the small and the big. It can have a tremendous impact on your life if you live with a thankful attitude, realizing I deserve nothing. And every, as James says, every good and perfect gift cometh down from the Father of lights in whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. Giving thanks is a way that we can be more filled with the Spirit. And here's the last one, verse 21. Submitting yourselves one to another in the fear of God. 
You want to have a spirit-filled life? Submit and surrender yourselves one to each other to serve each other. Then he tells us how in verse 23, end of verse chapter 6, 1 through 4. And he speaks, and I was wanting to preach on this this morning, but I felt the need in, in God's spirit leading me to, to backtrack to this. Notice, where does the submission begin? In our homes. That's where it begins. You want to live a spirit-filled life? Submit to the people in your home and begin to serve them. That is so the opposite of how we are wired, isn't it? That we're wired to be selfish and to prefer our own. But God says, you want to walk in the spirit, serve each other, submit to one another. And in that, you will be filled with the spirit. Jesus, even in Matthew chapter 20, I believe verse 28, it said, Son of man came not to be served, but to serve others. Philippians chapter 2, did he not say the same thing? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon himself the form of a servant. And in that service... God perpetually filled Jesus with his spirit for his entire life. That's not a coincidence. That's when we have a servant's heart. God God desires to live in the humble, meek dwelling place of your heart, not the pompous, entitled one. He sees a humble heart. We find all through the scriptures, the humble people. It wasn't Saul that became God's anointed king. It was little, humble, ruddy boy, David. That's where God wanted to take his presence, make his presence. It wasn't the big temple, I believe, that God wanted to dwell in. It was the tabernacle, the tent. And it's not the big cathedral in Rome that God wants to dwell in. It's in your humble heart. You want to be filled with God's spirit? Take upon yourself a servant's heart. That includes, is not a begrudging service, but joyful service, the Intonation of what we're doing is with joy and humility and meekness. This morning, covered a lot of territory. The purpose of our message this morning, how we ought to walk as Christians. Trying to get to what Paul is saying here, we ought to walk carefully, being careful with our time, understanding what the will of the Lord is, and being filled with His Spirit. I hope this morning, God, this week, I told Kathleen as I was studying this on Wednesday or Thursday, I told Kathleen, I felt so convicted this week because there are so many of these things that I I guess I just didn't see that I'm thankful God revealed them to me. I want to be more that way. I want to walk worthy of the calling. Why? Not because I feel enslaved to it, because I want to show God back how much I love what he's done for me. That's our message this morning. I pray that God would have helped you get something out of the thoughts today.